As we continue on our series of great Bible events, we're going to talk today about good old-fashioned gospel preaching. When I first started to study to read for this sermon, and I read through this section of Scripture, Acts chapter 13, verses 15 through 41, as I first started to read it, you know, I thought to myself, you could almost just get up, read that section of Scripture, and say a prayer and go home, because it really says it all. And that's why we're talking about here. We have an occasion where Paul is preaching in the synagogue. So here we have recorded a sermon of Paul to the Jews in the Jewish synagogue. I'm not going to just read it all and say a prayer and go home because after getting into studying it, there's a lot more that you can get out of it than the simple reading of it. But it, it, just, it just was so moving, I thought, as I read it, I just wanted to share that with you. And also, I might be remiss in saying that when you read the very first uh, verse of this selection here, where it says, And after the reading of the law and the prophets, the rulers of the synagogue sent unto them, saying, Ye men and brethren, if ye have any word of exhortation for the people, say on. We realize that it was the custom in the Jewish synagogues to get up and read some out of the prophets and then read some out of the law, and that might be all that was done. But here they're showing us that after the reading of the scripture, after a reading of the prophets and of the law, then it is good for a man to stand up and give some exhortation from that scripture. So therefore, if I were to simply read this section of scripture and dismiss this and go home, then we would be missing out on the exhortation portion that Paul so graciously gives us here in the scriptures. We see here, as we look at this, as I, as I read it, there's a couple places in scripture that really just are the gospel in a nutshell. And they just wrap it all up for us. John 3.16, you know, John chapter 3 is one of those that just kind of just lays it all out for you. And this is another one where Paul simply just lays out the gospel plain and clear. And when you find these sections of scripture, it just makes you wonder. It makes you pause and look around and wonder, how can anyone miss it? when it's laid out so clearly. When it's defined so precise and so exact, how can anyone miss it? How can anyone think that there's more to it or that there has to be other things added to it when it's just so wonderfully laid out for us here? But it says uh, in verse 16 that after they were invited to speak, it says that Paul then stood up and beckoned with his hand said, men of Israel and ye that fear God, give audience. He says, listen to what I have to say because it's going to be something good. And he starts off addressing them as men of Israel and those that fear God. Okay, well, what's the difference between the two? Why would there be two different types of people? Why are they not one and the same? Well, more, more than likely what Paul is referring to here he, is those the men of Israel, those that are Jews by birth those that are of the seed of Abraham, and those that fear God, those that are proselytes, those that had learned and had converted into Judaism, that may have been born of a Gentile parents, but yet have followed the Jewish religion and law. And so Paul sits here and addresses them both. Perhaps he had to get up and wave his hands because maybe there were some in the audience that didn't like the fact that the rulers of the synagogue had invited him to speak. Some of them may have not felt so kindly towards the gospel of Jesus Christ and weren't happy about the fact that Paul was there. There could have been some commotion going on as he stood up, but Paul simply raises his hand and says, listen to what I have to say. Give me audience. I have something good for you. I have some good news. I have something to share that will be of a great benefit to you. So he stands up and starts to deliver. And as he starts to deliver, he goes in and he... he gladly embraces the opportunity to preach to them. He doesn't shy away from it. He doesn't say, well, I'm a stranger here. I don't have any right to get up and talk to you. It's none of my business. He doesn't get up and say, oh, well, they might not like me if I start to preach Jesus Christ to them. He doesn't say that at all. He gladly takes this opportunity to, to 
give the wonderful announcement of Jesus Christ. So we see in here this excellent sermon of Paul. And one of the reasons that this sermon specifically is recorded, most of the sermons of Paul, you might notice, are given to Gentiles. But here is a sermon of Paul given to the Jews. And it's given to the Jews and it's recorded here for us that we might understand that the Bible promises us and the Bible is, t tells us that the gospel is to be preached to the Jews first. And so here we see Paul preaching to the Jews. And when the Jews rejected, then he re starts preaching unto the Gentiles. But here we see... As he preaches to the Jews, the Jews no, cannot then have excuse to say, well, this was a, an exhortation to all. It was an exhortation to the Gentiles. Therefore, it doesn't apply to us. No, here we see Paul delivering the gospel message to a Jewish nation so they can understand it applies to them just as much as to anybody else. Now, as he starts to get in into this message, the first thing he does is he owns the Jewish people as God's chosen people. He lays it right out to him. He says, I understand the God of this people of Israel chose our fathers and exalted the people when they dwelt as strangers in the land of Egypt. He starts to lay it out for him. He says, I understand that you are God's chosen people, and I understand that we have a God that's in covenant with the Jewish nation. God has chosen you out as a peculiar people. You are his favored. Now, he says this to them. He says it basically because he chose their fathers to be his friends. God had chosen his fathers. Abraham, we know, was called the friend of God. So we look at this and we see God favoring the people of Israel. And the people of Israel, undeserving of this favor. And in fact, Sometimes doing things that undeserve that favor. They had done nothing of themselves. These people that Paul was actually speaking to, the Jewish people as they were at this time, had done nothing to deserve that favor of God. But yet they had it because God had chosen their fathers. And because God had a, made a covenant with their fathers. And that's what Paul starts laying out here. And he starts to go through them, their history, and says, He chose our fathers, and then he, he brought us up out of Israel. He carried us out of Israel. And he didn't just do it in a simple manner, but he did it with his mighty hand. And he showed himself to be a God of gods and the Lord of lords and the King of kings because he, had, he used his mighty hand to deliver us out of Israel. And not only that, but then for 40 years as we wandered the wilderness. It says, it says here in verse 18, it says, Suffered he their manners in the wilderness. In other places of scripture, that, that uh, same word that is translated there can be also uh, translated as in, he educated them. He basically schooled them as they went through the wilderness. But as you look at their great journey through the wilderness, he's gonna, Paul is reminding them, of the great provisions that God provided for them. You know, for 40 years, God fed them. Every meal was a miracle. Can you imagine every meal that you eat being a miracle? That would be something, wouldn't it? You didn't have to go out and, and, and work and sweat and earn a job and go to the grocery store and buy it. It would just simply rain from heaven and there was your meal. He provided such great provisions for them. You think of the enormity of the people as they're traveling through this wilderness. The large numbers of people that were involved all in all their cattle and all their um, the wives, the children, just a huge mass. And move a whole society from Egypt to Israel. It would be a, a logistical nightmare. Even for some of the most prepared. You take the the federal government that has to move troops around. The movements of troops that we do is nothing in comparison to the movement of the whole people of Israel from Egypt to Israel. But yet God provided the provisions. God made sure they had a way to, to survive. 
Not only did he provide all the provisions for them, but God showed them great patience. This was a people that all this time, they weren't exactly the most grateful of individuals, to put it kindly. Quite frequently, they would murmur against God, and they would say, we were better off back in Egypt. We might as well just turn around and go back. But God showed great patience with them and dealt with them. And many times he, he even thought he should destroy them. But because of Moses interce- interceding with prayer, he let them go on. At one time, God had gotten so angry with them, he told Moses, he said, I'm just going to wipe them all off, Moses, and I'm going to restart with you. And Moses says, don't do that. Don't do that, God. He says, I know that we're a stiff-necked people. We're, we're turned away from you, but, but give, us some chan- give us a chance, God. Will make you proud. But God exercised great patience with them. And after that time, as they come to the land of Israel, Paul says to lay out again the history of the nations. He says in verse 19, He had destroyed seven nations in the land of Canaan and divided the land by their lot. You know, here again, he's reminding them of the great favor that God had showed them. Why would God come in and destroy seven other nations just so they would have a place to stay? That was seven other peoples, seven other groups of people that God just said, okay, I promised this land to your fathers. I'm taking them out of the way and letting you move in. That was all of God. And Paul wanted to remind them of that. He wanted them to understand. He has to set it all up. And now he goes into setting up the in their history how they... Their government worked. And he said, after you took possession of the land, God gave you judges. You know, judges were the people that were supposed to help deliver them from the the oppressions that were coming from the outside world. And as they went through that space of about 450 years, and then Samuel the prophet comes around. And Samuel the prophet kind of moves from a judgeship more to a, a theocracy, where he starts to... Samuel himself almost runs the nation of Israel. But then it says that afterwards they desired a king. And God gave them Saul, the son of Sis, a man of the tribe of Benjamin, by the space of 40 years. And, you know, you remember Samuel had some heartache about that. But God said, Samuel, they're not rejecting you. They're rejecting me. So once again... Paul is reminding them of the many times in their history where God showed patience towards them. Where God showed a loving, long-suffering towards them. But at last, God said after Saul, he said, now it's my turn to pick your king. They were able to pick their first king, they got Saul. But now, God says, now I'm going to pick your king and it's going to be David. Because David was a man after God's own heart. That's what the scriptures tell us about him. They took Saul out of the way and they raised up David to them to be their king. And David had a great testimony. Here we said, God said of this, God said, I have found, and we read in verse 22, I have found David, the son of Jesse, a man after mine own heart, which shall fulfill all my will. You see, God said, I found David. I'm the one who chose him. I'm the one who sought him out. I'm the one who put him up in place of your nation to be your king. But then he he goes into now now that he's set up the history, now he's going to set up the promise. Paul wants to show them why was it so important. Well, here's the promise in verse 23. Of this man's seed hath God according to his promise Raised unto Israel a Savior, which is Jesus. So now we see the point. What's the point of all this history? The point is God raised up a Savior named Jesus. He raised him up and then he sent someone. He sent John the Baptist to come in and prepare the way for And Paul, again, wants to lay it all out to them. He wants to make sure that as he lays this out to them, that they don't have any excuse to say, well, we didn't know it was coming. 
You know, we see here that this account of the son of, of David, the Jesus himself, we, Paul is talking of a savior, a savior that's to come to deliver them out of the hands of their enemies. You know, all this history he's given before, all the different kings that have gone before, all the judges, all of them were supposed to help rule them and deliver them from their enemies. But here we have now one who delivers them from their worst enemy. An enemy that none of the others before him could have done. That enemy of sin in their lives. They now have a savior to deliver them from that sin in their life. Now John the Baptist comes in so that these Jews could not say to themselves that, that the Messiah's coming was a surprise to them. They would had no excuse to say they needed more time to consider whether or not this is right or not because John the Baptist started preparing them. All this has been preached to them before. They've heard these words before. And it said in verse 24, when John had first preached before his coming the baptism of repentance to all all the people of Israel. Now you look, the reason he brings up John, why bring up John in this mess? John's no longer around. But all the Jews honored him as a prophet. So you bring him into the mix and it starts to make people listen. We're going to pay attention a little bit more. So he says, now what did John say to us? It says in verse 25, when John fulfilled his course, he said, Whom think ye that I am? He says, I am not he. John the Baptist was teaching about a Messiah. He was teaching about someone who would take away their sin. But he says, I'm not that person. He says, that person is coming. Behold, there cometh one after me whose shoes of his feet I am not worthy to loose. You know, we all look at John the Baptist and we think, this was a mighty man of God. But John the Baptist looked at himself and said, I'm not even worthy to unlatch Jesus' shoelaces. If Jesus were to walk into this room, I wouldn't dare bend down and touch his feet. That's how unworthy I am. John wanted to make sure everyone knew. So Paul then says, Men and brethren, children of the stock of Abraham, and whosoever among you feareth God, to you is the word of this salvation sent. He wanted to make sure everyone understood. This is a message for you. He wanted to make sure everyone understood. This is not the message, like I said before at the beginning, Paul was preaching to the Jews. And he wanted to make sure every person who was a Jew understood that this was not. Paul did not come to this synagogue so that the Gentiles would hear. He came so that they would hear. He wanted them to hear. He wanted everyone to hear. And it's written for us so that we can have the benefit of it. So that we can hear. But now we see, as he goes into it, he wants to talk to them about this person. He says, now, this Jesus, this person that John the Baptist was talking about, he says, for they that dwelt at Jerusalem and their rulers, because they knew him not, nor yet the voices of the prophets, which are read every Sabbath day, they have fulfilled them in condemning him. You know, Peter taught a similar sermon in Jerusalem, and when he did it, he said, you are the ones that killed him. Now, Paul doesn't use such harsh words to these Jewish people because they are what you call the dispersion. They're not in Jerusalem. They weren't there. But yet, he lets them know that it was the people in Jerusalem. It was the Jews indeed in Jerusalem that persecuted and murdered the Savior. Every time that the, the apostles would preach Christ, they would always preach Christ crucified. Not only his crucifixion, but they would let it be known that it was by his own people that he was crucified. And even though they had found no cause of death in him, they compelled Pilate to crucify him. And here it said, Paul says, it's because they knew him not. 
You know, somewhere else in the scripture it said that they were kind of willingly ignorant towards who Jesus Christ was. They knew him not. They didn't know. Christ himself says that upon the cross. He says, forgive them, Father, for they know not what they do. It also said that they didn't understand what the prophets had said. Even though here Paul says, it's read out in the synagogue every Sabbath day, but they don't understand what the prophets had said. If they'd understood what the prophets had said about the suffering of the Messiah, they wouldn't have been a party to it. But because they didn't understand, they became participants in it. They didn't really understand the meaning of the scripture as it was read to them. You know, how many, how sad is it? How many people will come into a church? in today's age, and sit and listen, but not understand. And that's why I think it's important that sometimes we grab these simple gospel truths, this good old-fashioned gospel preaching that Paul was doing right here, and lay it all out. He said he was crucified. He says, and when they had fulfilled all that was written of him, they took him down from that tree and laid him in a sepulcher. But God raised him from the dead. God raised him from the dead. He rose again from the dead and he saw no corruption. That's what's in, it's more important for the Jews to understand that. It's important that they understand that, first of all, he, he rose by consent. He rose up. He was imprisoned by death. But yet he was released by God because there was no fair or legal claim for him to be there. What, what is the fair and legal claim to death? That is our sin. Christ had no sin. The wages of sin is death. Christ had no sin, therefore his wages should not have been death, but yet death had grabbed him hold. But Christ said, you don't God said, you don't deserve that, and then raise him up. Release him from that grave. He rose from consent. God raised him from the dead. And there's, secondly, Paul wanted to make sure they understood there was all kinds of sufficient proof of him being risen from the dead. He said, and when he was seen many days of them which came up with him from Galilee to Jerusalem, who are his witnesses unto the people. He said he was seen all kinds of different places. Different places, different times, with different people. Lots of people that will get up and even with threat of physical harm or death, these people will tell you they saw the risen Savior. They saw him. They talked to him. They touched his hands. They touched his side. And we know that the resurrection of Christ, that was a performance of the promise that was made to their fathers. You know, you see the Old Testament, that great promise of the Old Testament was that, was that of a Messiah in whom all the families of the earth should be blessed. Not just the family of Abraham, but all the families of the earth. Now, the blessing to the family of Abraham was it was through their seed that this Messiah would come. But he was going to come and be a blessing to all the families of the earth. It said in verse 33, or I'm sorry, go back to verse 32. It says, and we declare unto you glad tidings. How that the promise which was made unto the fathers, God hath fulfilled the same unto us their children, and that he hath raised up Jesus again. As it is also written in the second psalm, Thou art the Son, Thou art my Son, this day have I begotten thee. It was promised to the fathers, and now here's Paul telling them, Here is that promise fulfilled. And we, the children, we're here. We are blessed to be here and be part of it. To see it happen. 
to be witnesses of it, to be here firsthand. Yes, all of our fathers had that promise to them, but we got to be here. We got to be around as it happened, to be a part of it. Then, David, then he goes on to also quote some more scripture. Verse 34, and as concerning that he raised him up from the dead, now no more to return to corruption, he said on this wise, I will give you the sure mercies of David. Wherefore he saith also in another psalm, thou shalt not suffer thine holy one to see corruption. We see the resurrection of Christ was the great proof of him being the son of God. He was raised the third day so that he would not see corruption. The body doesn't start to decay till after that third day. So Christ rose again before his body started to decay, before there was any change in his body, before it started to see corruption. And also that, but he rose to die no more. You know, we see stories in the, in the New Testament, or even in the Old Testament, we see stories of people being risen from the dead. But every single one of those people died again. But here, Jesus Christ rises to die no more. And Paul makes that out to us. He tells us that. That was in verse 34. Now no more to return to corruption. Not going to die again. You know, Lazarus, when he was risen from the dead, he walked in his burial clothes. Because he was going to need to have use of them again. But when Jesus rose from the grave, he left his burial clothes behind. Because he was never going to need them again. And he rose so soon after his death that his body did not see that corruption. Because God had promised. He had made a promise to David that he would raise up a Messiah of his seed. Who should therefore, because he's the seed of David, would be a man but should not, like other men, see corruption. Now we see some people have thought that this might actually be David, but it cannot be David. And here Paul's going to let us know why this was not referring to David. He says in verse 36, For David, after he had served his own generation by the will of God, fell on sleep and was laid unto his fathers and saw corruption. You know, David had a job to do. David was called of God, and David was brought to the people of Israel by God, and he was chosen by God to do something. And he did it, and he served his time. That's what it said. He, he did his service to his own generation. He did the service he was supposed to do, and then he got to take his rest. For the saved believer, death is not a bad thing. It's a time of rest. You know, we have our work to do when we're here. We work and we toil and we sweat. But in death, we have our rest. We have our ease. And it says here that David fell on sleep and took his rest after he'd done his work. But David was laid to his fathers, meaning he was laid into the grave to join his fathers before him that had done their work and had gone on. But laying in that grave, David has seen corruption. His body's decayed. It's still there in the tomb. But yet, it says in verse 37, But he whom God raised again saw no corruption. It's not still there. There's an empty tomb. There's no body there. There's nothing that's decaying. All this was accomplished in the Lord Jesus. You know, Paul wanted to make sure they understood this was sent to them. And so he says to them in verse 38, Be it known unto you, therefore, men and brethren, that through this man is preached unto you the forgiveness of sin. So he says, now I'm going to bring it down to the real reason I'm telling you all this. Why is this so important? Why is it so important that we understand who this Jesus is? And what this Messiah is because of the forgiveness 
of sin. Now, how am I going to get that forgiveness of sin? In verse 39, it says, And by him all that believe are justified from all things, from which you could not be justified by the law of Moses. Okay? When I read that, I thought, man, that's just so clear. But just in case you didn't get the same feeling, let me clarify for you. Those that believe in Jesus Christ are forgiven from their sins. Those that are trying to work according to the law are not. Plain and simple. That's what it's telling us here. That's what Paul wanted to make sure they understood. And this was, he was teaching this to a Jewish congregation that had so ingrained their religion into the law of Moses. But he's reminding them of something, and something they should have known all along. That the law of Moses was there to show you what is right from wrong, and to show you that you cannot be perfected in the law. It was there to teach you that you cannot earn your way to be with God. But if you believe in Jesus Christ, that's all it takes. The goal of every religion should be to justify man before God. And here Paul is saying, the only way you're going to be justified is to believe in Jesus Christ. There is no other way. The law fails. The law of Moses cannot do that. It doesn't matter what part of the law of Moses you look at. You know, the law of Moses had first the things that you had to do. Then it also had the law of sacrifices to try and bring yourself back to God. But it says, you know, the scripture tells us that, that um, it was not possible that the blood of bulls and goats should take away sin. But the blood of Jesus Christ does. Now here he's telling them, he says, it's going to be to your unspeakable advantage, my brethren. He's telling them, he wants to draw them near to him. He's calling them brethren. He says, it's going to be to your advantage if you listen to what I have to say. And if you embrace this gospel of Jesus Christ. Because he's the only one that's going to relieve you from that guilt of sin. Nobody else is going to be justified by Christ alone. The Bible tells us we're all sinners. We've all come short of the glory of God. And so our concern should then be, how do we make ourselves right with God? If we're all sinners, if we've all failed, how are we going to do that? Well, we're only going to do that. We're only going to be acquitted and be found guiltless through the righteous blood of Jesus Christ. To be truly justified, to be truly acquitted from that guilt, we have to put our faith and trust in Jesus. The law of Moses isn't going to do it for us. Amen. Following the Ten Commandments isn't going to do it for us. Going to church every Sunday isn't going to do it for us. Paying our tithing isn't going to do it for us. Crawling into the baptismal waters isn't going to do it for us. We have to put our faith and trust in Jesus Christ. Because by Jesus Christ, we obtain a complete justification. A finished justification. Said and done. Finished. The transaction completed. Signed, sealed, and delivered. He says, by him, all that believe are justified from all things. From all things. And then he cautions them. He says, Beware, therefore, lest that come upon you which is spoken of in the prophets. Behold, ye despisers, and wonder, and perish. For I work a work in your days, a work which ye shall in no wise believe, though a man declare it unto you. Paul has just taken the time to carefully lay out the gospel plan to these people. And now he's telling them, listen. Listen to what I had to say. He said the prophets foretold that there's going to be a group of Jews that aren't going to listen. That even though it's taught to them, even though it's preached to them, they are going to despise the words that are heard and they will perish. So Paul says, don't, don't let that be your lot in life. Because what the law of Moses could not do for you, 
what the law of Moses cannot do for us, the gospel of Jesus Christ does and can and will. And that is some good old-fashioned gospel preaching. Well, Stan will be dismissed in a word of prayer.